All right, it's two minutes past the hour of two. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Receive very warm greetings from the East Africa Law Society. We are honored to host you for yet another exciting uh, 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 webinar session. And this time we're discussing the efficacy of the treaty establishing the East African community. And we are uh, trying to advance a debate on whether this, uh, th this treaty is due for amendment or not due for amendment. We have uh, quite a, 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 a composed panel of different experts from different fields here to share uh, their experiences. And before they do so, allow me to invite our chairperson of the Rule of Law Committee, uh, Moarimo Evan Zogada. Uh, Doctor, if you can hear us, uh, please uh, unmute and uh, open the session with uh, some remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Gabriel. Good afternoon. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite well. Thank you very much. I'm on the road, but nonetheless, the rule of law and uh, East Africa affairs are close to my heart. I am glad to always join. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our annual series of webinars. As uh, the East Africa Law Society, we continue uh, mounting conversations about our uh, uh, our region, our East Africanness, and what we can do to uh, improve on uh, our federation. On behalf of the president of the East Africa Law Society Council, uh, President Judge Fauz, uh, the secretariat led by my able brother, David Sigano, we want to welcome you. Please feel free, ask your questions. Uh, let us have this shared experience because the better we will become when we learn and identify the challenges and build on the progress made so far. So without further ado, may I welcome my senior, my good friend, um, Mrs. Faith Masharia Okalo, who is the moderator for today's uh, uh, session. Over to you, senior. Thank you so much, Mr. Ogada, for those opening remarks. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this session. My name is Faith Mashari Okalo. I'm a partner at Airline Kenya. In the disputes team, I'm also the chairperson of the Trade and Regional Committee. And today I've been invited by my brother and my learned counsel, Mr. Ogada, to help to facilitate this, this webinar. So once again, welcome all to this session and thank you for joining us. And the topic of our discussion today is evaluating the efficacy of the treaty for the establishment of the East African community. Now, our collective aim today is just to assess the effectiveness of the provisions of the treaty in contributing to the agenda of regional integration, you know, economic cooperation and social development within our region, the East Africa region. Now, through our discussion, we'll aim or we'll seek to assess the strengths the weaknesses and the extent to which it has fulfilled its, its objectives. And we welcome your views. You can use the chat box. You can raise your hands up. We just encourage you to share your views. If you have any questions, your reactions, even your contribution to this important debate through the chat box and we'll be able to look at the comments, the questions as they come and be able to get back to you. Now at this point and without much ado, it is my distinct honor and privileged to introduce our esteemed panel of speakers. We have a long list of panelists, seven panelists, each of whom bring a wealth of experience, expertise, and insight to day discussions. If I can ask my panelists who can hear me just to switch on their videos kindly. So our first speaker, that will be Dr. Caroline Asimwe, so Dr. Caroline Asimo is serving as Executive Secretary of the East African Kiswahili Commission. I know some of us may be hearing about this commission for the first time. So Dr. Caroline Asimo will tell us a little bit more about this commission and just to mention that it's an institution of the East African community. So Dr. Asimo brings a unique perspective into today's discussions rooted in linguistics and regional integration. So our second speaker, that will be Dr. Abdullah Makame. So he's a distinguished member of parliament of the East Africa Legislative uh, Assembly. 
Now he will be joining us. He's still uh, held up in a meeting that is happening at the East African Legislative Commission. But shortly, just about in five minutes, I know he'll be uh, joining us just to give us his uh, his uh, perspective from you know legislative uh, angle and obviously from his experience in regional uh, cooperation. Our next speaker that will be Dr. Fred Mukasambide. So he's the vice president of the Democratic Party in Uganda, and he's also a former member of parliament at the East African Legislative Assembly. So we expect him to bring to us a wealth of political experience and strategic vision in today's um, uh, dialogue. He'll also be logging in a bit late into the discussion as he's, he's currently en route to his destination. Our fourth speaker will be His Worship, Yufnalis Okubo. So he's the former registrar of the East African Court of Justice, and he brings a deep understanding of legal frameworks and institutional dynamics within the East Africa community. With his vast experience and insights, we anticipate a thought-provoking examination of the progress made thus far and the challenges that lie ahead in realizing the ESC vision. Our next speaker, that would be Mr. John Bosco Kalisa. So he serves as the Chief Executive Office of the East Africa Business Council, where he spearheads initiatives to promote trade and investment across the region. So he's going to bring his insight from the private sector perspective, which I believe will be invaluable to a discussion on the future of regional integration. We also have uh, Senior Counsel Mr. Charles Kanjama. So he's a Senior Counsel in Kenya. He's the chair of the Kenya, profession, Kenya Christian Professional Forum and also a practicing advocate and the managing partner at Moomin Kanjama Advocates, one of the leading law firms in Kenya. So he's going to bring his extensive legal expertise and broad ranging experience. So we'll gain a deep understanding of the varied perspective from the legal perspective, from you know, the common wanainchi and insight regarding the efficacy from Mr. Kanjama. Last and not least, we have Miss, Miss Lillian Alex. So she serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the East African Civil Society, and she champions the voice of civil society in advancing regional integration. So her insight into the role of stakeholders will be instrumental in our discussions in implementing reforms and advancing integration. So that is our list of panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, and without much uh, further ado, I will jump into today's discussion, evaluating the efficacy of the treaty for the. And I think a good place to start from is just by setting the context. And I'll start by asking His Worship Yufnali Sokubo to help us understand this question. Now, given that the East Africa Community Treaty, it was, a, it was signed in 1999. Now it came into force in 2000. So we are looking about over two decades since its inception. Do you think that the provisions of these treaties are still effective today? Are the provisions facilitating the intended regional integration, corporate, economic cooperation or social development? Over to you, His Worship. You're muted, Your Worship. Please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Thank you very much, Faith and the team, for this opportunity to look at the ESC treaty. Now, as Faith has said, the treaty is now 24 years ever since it was passed. Uh, so you need to look at it in the context of when it was passed 24 years ago, how many members were they? Three only. You can imagine council of ministers sitting only three in one table. They actually require a coffee table and they will still sit and discuss. Now we are talking about having how many members? Eight. Then from the time it was amended, it is 17 years ever since the last amendment. In fact, anybody looking at the treaty, anything you see in italic, that was the amendment. So if you want to know the treaty before the amendment, don't look at the italics. That is what you will see what the treaty used to be. Now, it has objectives very well set out in Article 5, eh? which talks about uh, corporations in political, social, and cultural fields, technology, even defense, and security and judicial affairs. The objectives are brought out very well. In those objectives, you'll find the partner states undertook then to establish the custom union. These are the main pillars of integration. 
common market, uh, monetary union, and finally, the political federation. All those had timelines, others which have been met, others have not been met. Why? We'll be looking at that. But at the same time, without forgetting, as you look at the treaty, you cannot look at the treaty without looking at the protocols that go with it. Some of the problems in the treaty are actually arising out of the protocol. Some of the things the treaty cannot has missed out or some of the things that cannot be achieved, you will find they're actually emanating from the provisions of the protocol. So to achieve those objectives, the community was supposed to ensure the attainment of sustainable growth, uh, uh, strengthening and consolidating cooperation in various fields, agreed areas, where and then the benefits will go to all the members. Some of them include, for example, a sustainable development in natural resources, consolidating political and economic uh, gains, uh, mainstreaming gender, uh, partnership with the private sector and social, uh, I mean, uh, civil society. If that could be attained, then we will say we have attained regional integration, economic cooperation, and even social developments. But as I said, the treaty is 24 years. Out of those 24 years, to what extent can we say that it has played a role or it has moved towards those attainments? I'll pick certain sections of the treaty which I'll look at just to try and see what happened. And I'll also try to bring in what we had in what we used to call, what we've been calling ESC-1. That is the original ESC that went under in 1977. So you'll find like the first part of the treaty that is in fact from Article 1 to about 22 simply talks about the structure. I mean, the organs, the summit, what was all, those are the ones that are, are supposed to provide the policy policy guidance to, to the community. Then after that, we have the court starting in Chapter 8, starting with the Article 23, which will show you the jurisdiction, uh, various provisions, uh, including judges, and even uh, what happens to, to, to uh, acceptance of the judgments of the court. Now, the court is important here because without a strong judicial body, you cannot talk about integration. Integration involves a lot of complex matters. There are a lot of disputes. There are misinterpretations and, mass and wrong interpretations. And who do you need to correct that so that you move forward? You will need the court. So uh, the court is very important. Then we also have, a, a, as we look at matters of the court, we must also look at the provisions on legal and judicial affairs. That is chapter 24. This is where we talk about a common syllabus in judicial trainings, harmonization of national laws, revival of the publication of East African Law Society. I'm not sure that a publication has been revived. What I've seen is each country now publishing its own law reports. Uh, which is still good, but it would have been better if we had one publication for East Africa just to harmonize our jurisprudence. Uh, and then from uh, chapter 9, we have EALA. How does the community operate? It also needs the laws, which will be supernatural to the national laws. So EALA comes in there. It is therefore important. Of course, what you'll notice is that uh, most of the bills passed by EALA are from private members. And when they are private members, they end up there. Very few member, uh, very few bills that have been brought by a private member actually get enacted into law. What does that tell you? Only the laws brought, bills brought by partner states, will move forward and they will get uh, and they will be eventually be passed into acts of the community. But uh, again, that begs the question: Then, where is the interest? Is it partner states' interest? or EALA, which represent the citizens' interest. That is something to look at, and it goes towards then achieving the objectives of the community. From chapter 11, we see the main things now that deal with the community. This is now trade liberalization. Things to do with ESC trade regimes, establishment of the customs union, common market, and the monetary union. Of course, customs union, uh, it went on very well and uh, it met the timelines. The same to the common markets. 
It is also there that we had the trade imbalance. And remember what happened with the trade imbalance. The Kenyan goods, was, uh, they said Kenyan goods, if they go into the other East African countries, they'll be taxed on them. Although it will reduce up to five years. After five years, it should be zero. It will be zero. But similar goods from those other partner states, for them to come to Kenya, they will come in duty-free. Of course, Kenya accepted knowing its, uh, its competitive advantage. And that was implemented very, very, very well. Of course, the monetary union, we are still, the community is still struggling, still trying to find a common place to establish the, a, a, a monetary union. Something again of interest there is that during the ESC one, you know, we had a common currency. Why can't we have it now? Is it the treaty that is, uh, that is preventing us? Is it the political interest or is it the physical policies that are making us not be able to have a common currency? Then also there's a provision, this is chapter 12, in uh, cooperation investment and industrial developments. This is where we talk about development of a sustainable industrial growth, which we need it if we are going to change the lives of the East Africans. Expansion in trade, uh, trade uh, industrial goods within the community, export of industrial goods. Do any of our East African region really export industrial goods other than agriculture produce? So where are we on that? Is that where we should be or we should move forward? Was the treaty done anything to promote that? What is stopping us from also being an industrial exporter than being just a, 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 an agriculture exporter? Then we have a provision on standardizations and quality. Do we have harmonized standard policy? If goods leave one country and going to another country have a, that uh, uh, mark of quality, are they accepted straight away in that country? Or again, you'll find that country saying, no, we must test these goods to see if they're of the same standard. We still have issues there. Uh, monetary and financial corporations. This is where we talk about uh, convertibility of our currencies. I think if you look around uh, the East African region, other than maybe one or two countries, you can, uh, or three now, you can easily exchange our currencies. I don't know about DRC, uh, South Sudan. I know you, you get out of that country with that currency, you are dead with it until you go back there. Somalia, I'm not even sure what currency they are using now that they are members. So harmonizing microeconomic policies, removing obstacles to free movement of goods and services, capital, even the free movement of, 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 of capital. You realize when it comes to things like... Uh, physical policies, the debt of our reading of our budget is supposed to be the same throughout, maybe with an allowance of one or two days. Is that happening? Why? The financial year of our countries is supposed to be the same. I don't know if Burundi has so far changed its financial year because it used to start in January and end in December, when all the others were starting in July and ending in June. I don't know about DRC, I'm not sure about Somalia. If we cannot harmonize that, how are we moving ahead? In a fiscal policy. So of course, we need within these fiscal policies for integration to grow. Removal of controls. We also talk about uh, removal of controls on the capital. Do we easily move capital within the community? And uh, there was also a, an important provision that deals with integration that is uh, infrastructure. Do we have common transport and communication policies in the region? Look at one, one stop border post. We are so happy launching one stop border post. My view is that if we are integrating, we should be breaking down these one stop border posts. Yet we are so happy launching them. Why is it in Europe we just move from one country to another? When they were integrating, they were bringing down those borders. Yet here we are busy putting up those, those borders. Look at road and transport. Do we have common standards of vehicle construction? For example, manufacturers of our buses, if we have them. Do we have common standards? You, or do we even have uh, common regulations on speed limits in our urban roads? You drive in Kenya, there's a yellow line in the middle of the road. You reach Tanzania, there's a white line in the middle of the road. We cannot even harmonize those simple things. So a, a driver is likely to be confused. In Kenya, there's a yellow line dotted or dot, dotted. It gets to Tanzania, there's a white line in the middle of the road. Do they mean different things? Simple things that are very important for, for harmonization. Railways. I think compared to ESC1, we have failed here. We used to have what we called the common assets of the community. The railways used to be East African railways and harbors, belonged to all of us. The ports used to be Kenya, uh, East African cargo and handling, belonging to all of us. 
we had the uh, East African uh, Airways belonging to all of us. Now everybody has ease. Look at Kenya. Kenyans now stuck with their SGR. They thought they will take the SGR to the border of Uganda. Uganda picks it up from there. It is stuck with it. Tanzania has come up with their own. We don't know who they are going. A pipeline was supposed to come from Uganda up to up to up to Lamu or Mombasa. Uh, the other partner jumped, went his way, saying he'll join. Where are we really going? In, going in communication. So how we are in communication and infrastructure transport? Are we really harmonizing this? If we are to grow and attain the objectives of the of the community as set out in Article Five, the same to civil aviation. In as much as we have Kasoa in Entebbe trying to regulate the airspace, are we doing well? As a, as, as a community in, in, in aviation. First of all, we are competing amongst ourselves. Everybody has got his own airline, not only uh, his own airline, and competing over the same, same customer and going to the same, same destination. Is that healthy for the region? Even the, the uh, look at the uh, those uh, aircrafts themselves. Each company is, each country is buying their aircrafts from different companies. We have those buying uh, from Canada Bombardiers. We have those buying uh, from uh, Boeing. We have those buying from Brazil, uh, the, the, the Embraers. So even when it comes to sourcing spare parts, look at you what require. Every country doesn't require a lot of spare parts. But then it will be expensive because you're not buying in bulk. Suppose they were to come together and say, look, we all buy from Boeing. That means we can import spare parts in bulk, put them in one place within the region where we need to just go have your plane fixed. We cannot agree on such things. Instead, we are competing. Then, how does the community grow? Uh, again, on telecommunication, one area network. I think that is partially working very well. We hope. I'm not very sure if Tanzania has so far joined the one area network. But it's good that you can move from Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. Use your mobile phone at the same, same rate. Then uh, we have a uh, human resource. This is important for the community. If you are going to achieve those, uh, those objectives, then development of human resource is important. We have the Inter-University Council of East Africa, sources scholarships for the people of East Africa, tries to standardize the education uh, curriculum of universities. What I'm not sure now, if it is like before that you can start first year in Uganda, go to second year in Tanzania, come to third year in Kenya, go and finish wherever and still get the same degree. There is still a problem there. Movement of persons, yes, we have done re done relatively well, but I think something still needs to be done. I don't know whether it's a treaty or more of national policy issues. We can see among the three countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, that you can now board a plane with an ID. Can you enter Tanzania with an ID? Can you enter Burundi with an ID? Why is it that difficult? The issue of visas within even the region something which should have been re removed it takes more of a political uh, political angle either the visa is very expensive or you apply you never get it right of residence it took kenya uh, president of kenya to make a political statement for it to work all he did was a president to stand up and say so long as you're from east africa come to Kenya, get land by get a job work get a lady marry or be married there simple like that and it went on but if we were to take the policy of the ESC movement, I doubt if that will have moved. Cooperation on political matters, this is also a very tricky issue. Uh, we have seen matters of regional peace and security. In that even where our own members have issues uh, with their neighbors, sometimes they don't want to use our own mechanism to solve their problems. We saw what happened between Rwanda and Uganda. They went instead to South Africa to try and solve their problems there, left the mechanism in the region. What does that tell us? They tell us about their faith in our system in solving their security problems. And then, of course, we have the private sector and civil society. Very important. These are the drivers of integration. Government simply supplies, I mean, some simply gives an enabling environment. So we have EABC, and I'm glad that the CEO is here, doing a very good job in, in championing private sector's interest. Then we have other, of course, the professional organization also like ELS, ESCOF, that also brings together uh, different professions and different civil societies in the region. Then I must mention the Article 140, the transition provision. After 20, with it for 24 years now, the court is still transiting. Isn't that very absurd? 
that 24 years the court has not reached where it's supposed to treat it is still supposed it's to be to be transiting that it will only become operational when uh, i mean it will cease to transit when the court becomes fully operational so what does fully operational mean does it mean when you have many cases or you have the 10 judges in the first instance field and five in the appellate division it is a sad affair that uh, that is still happening now we cannot talk about achieving the objectives of the treaty without talking about article 150 which provides for amendment of the treaty in my view this article slows down the achievements of the objectives of the treaty because it removes the mandate of proposing amendments from the from from, from the people centered and only gives it to partner state that an amendment can only pro be proposed by a partner state does does a, does the treaty belong to the partner states who is more affected by the treaty? It should be the Mwananchi. In the same way we are saying that any citizen can go to court. Likewise, I mean, the same way we say any resident. Likewise, any resident of the community should be able to propose an amendment. And when you leave it to partner states to propose amendments from a treaty, we know what they do. They only bring amendments that are of their interest. Look at the last amendment. It was brought by partner states. Why? because they were not happy about a court decision. So those amendments were coming because of their interest, not because of the interest of this uh, Monanchi, the people-centered person. In 2017, there was a proposal to amend the treaty. And you know what it was? That the treaty should be amended so that when the Secretary General is sued, he does not pay costs. Just imagine how the, the secretariat will have been behaving if they know even if you win the case they will not be subjected to pay costs they can do anything they won't care of uh, they won't pay costs so it was shot down from the word go from every angle leave alone the other aspect of the imbalance because we are supposed to be equal before the court but now here you're saying no 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 the, uh, you cannot be equal to the secretariat you if you lose you'll pay costs but if the secretariat loses they won't pay costs so it was shot down but as that proposal was going around, the partner says for them to give views, South Sudan swings up with their own proposal. Their proposal was to amend the treaty to have more judges in the appellate division so that South Sudan can have a judge there. How is that helping? You see, their proposal are mainly to their benefit, a partner state's benefit, not to the Mwananchi who is, who, who, is, who, who is affected by the implementation of the community. That is one area, if we talk about amending the treaty, I will start with that provision. Now, we have uh, seen from records that intra esc trade is only 15%. intra esc is only 15%. That means what? We must be having trade barriers. And we have tools to address these trade barriers. Why haven't we addressed these trade barriers to at least increase the intra esc trade? We have issues with NTBs all along. We have issues with the harmonization of taxes. We have issues with border facilitations. All of these affect uh affect the attainment of the objectives the common external tariff how how effective is it we have some countries of course implementing it very well but others are still again at the bottom of it they have not even moved when shall we then be equal to say the cet is effective now what also profounds all these problems as i said are some of the protocols which are part and parcel of the treaty and the biggest protocol to this problem is a protocol on decision making which says all decisions shall be by consensus. When you st when you when you enacted this protocol, what when it was passed, when, when the treaty was enacted, you were three members. It was very easy for three people to come to a consensus. Now we are eight. Really, that eight people can easily come to a consensus unless what you are discussing is really really to their interest. And where else do we have that? If you look at Commerce Treaty, there's nothing like that. If you look at Sadak, there's nothing like that. If you look at eager treaty is nothing like that so can you imagine if african union you, know, you are to say that all the 54 or 50 something countries must agree for any resolution to go through now that protocol goes ahead to list down what can only be passed by consensus and it lists very many things one of the things which if you are to change you must have consensus is amendment of the treaty itself then another one is amendment of that protocol itself so even if you want to amend that protocol, you must have a consensus. Leave, you have not even reached to amending, amending the, the treaty. It literally lists down almost everything. 
and leaves no room for anything that can be decided without consensus. To me, that is a very, very big hindrance to the, to the community attaining its objective. So what happens, a very good agenda is being discussed at the council level. Something very good. But because one country says no, or it says it still wants to go and consult, and it you can consult forever anyway, because there's no time limit for, for consulting, that good idea will just die and disappear like that, which is not good. The first attack, when it comes to amending the treaty, we must start with that protocol and Article 150. That does not mean we have not had some successes anyway. They are quite there. Others are very low hanging. You can always see them, like the use of national IDs to travel. That is something very good. The electronic passport, although it doesn't touch on Wanachi so much, but that is a very good uh, development. The one area network, it is also very good. I hope many countries are going to join. The single custom territory, that's a good progress from our, from our treaty, the custom unions and the common market. Uh, those are very good developments. But my final view is that it is not enough. Something drastically needs to be done to the treaty if we are to move forward and, uh, and attain those objectives. The objectives are very good uh, set up. The only problem has been, how do you get the partner states to amend the treaty? The last amendment of 207 came out because there was a crisis. So if you don't have a crisis, they will not move. And I think I said it in one forum, that I wish somebody could create a crisis because that's the only thing that will make them then amend the treaty. <laughs> Since then, we are pushing, we were pushing, we need, they, it is not of interest. They are, com they are in their comfort zones where they are. Why? Because the treaty also says it is them to bring the amendments. Look at it if it was saying that any resident of the community can propose amendments. Maybe things will have moved and we have the treaty amended. Uh, allow me to stop there, but I'll keep uh, contributing as we go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, His Worship, Ifnari Sokubo. That has been a very productive, informative, insightful, thought-provoking way of starting out this discussion. I can see the comments are coming in in our chat box, and we just encourage our participants to keep commenting. I mean, we've come out to the question that I would like us to think through, even as the panelists that are coming along, maybe you can just take one or two minutes to comment on that. I'll also appreciate to get comments from the participants. And the big question is, how do we get the partner states to amend the treaty? You've had the, the challenges that we go about it. The residents of ESC, we don't have an opportunity to, 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 to make proposals. And even if we do that, they're not taken up. So how do we get the partner states to amend the treaty. So we do appreciate that we have very good provisions in our treaty. It seems the biggest uh, challenge is it's when it comes to implementation, but his worship has also highlighted some key provisions of the treaty that need to be looked into if we are told we were to take this agenda of regional integration to the next level. So let me hear your views on how do we get partner states to amend the treaty. So thank you so much for setting out the context and for sharing your thoughts, which I must say that I substantially agree with on the effectiveness of, of the treaty. And we'll get to hear the views of our panelists as we go along. Now with this context in mind, I would like now to turn to you, Senior Counsel, Mr. Kanjama. If you can kindly switch on your video. And I just want to seek your views on whether the legal practitioners you know, the business community, the ordinary residents of ESC, you know, affectionately referred to as Wanjiku, back home in care. Do will, will their views, do you think their views will align with, or will they, or will they diverge from the insights provided by his, his worship regarding the efficacy of the treaty? Do individuals, do these residents in ESC community genuinely experience the effects, the benefit of the ESC treaty. Over to you, Mr. Kanjama. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Council Masharia, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants in this session. Uh, my co-panelists have really enjoyed listening to uh, Mr. Okubo present about uh, the entire context of the East African Community Treaty which was a great refresher, I think, for all of us. 
myself, uh, my role is very simple. I've been asked to give the perspective of legal practitioners, business community, and common residents to the efficacy of the treaty. And uh, I propose to do this, first of all, by uh, locating who are these people uh, that have been asked to talk about what uh, are their views on the East African Community Treaty, what aspects of the treaty do they have views on, and uh, how has the efficacious has the treaty been? Uh, first, I would say that uh, there is a diverse group here. You have common residents who have very little knowledge of the contents of the East African Community Treaty. Our traders, uh, sometimes they are told when you are transporting goods from one country to the other, importing, exporting, there are these uh, provisions of the East African Customs Management uh, Treaty or Act that you need to comply with. But they don't know the contents of the East African Community Treaty itself. They don't know them directly. Uh, members of the business community, they interact with certain manifestations of regional integration, both positive and negative. But again, they don't know the contents of the East African Community Treaty. For legal practitioners, majority of the legal practitioners, when they discuss the East African Community Treaty, their focus is on the question of whether lawyers can practice across uh, borders in East Africa. And again, there has been controversy there there have been moments when we seemed to be making a step forward and then we made certain number of steps backwards. And again, uh, lawyers or legal practitioners have adopted uh, an approach of trying to protect their home turf. And if lawyers are the ones who are going to champion the process of regional integration, economic integration, to go, as uh, Mr. Okubo has told us, towards monetary union, even political integration, which are some of the objectives in the East African Community Treaty. And yet, in our own practice area as lawyers, we are worried about integrating, uh, about creating a common market for services, about free movement of professionals from one country to the other in East Africa. Then it seems that the goals of the East African Community Treaty, which are expressed in writing, are actually in practice quite far from attainment. If our mentality in our different East African countries, and, and we have seen this when the Law Society of Kenya or the Law Society in Uganda or Tanganyika, when they are meeting to discuss issues of regional integration, there's always that question of, can we integrate can we allow lawyers from this country to come here? Won't they overwhelm us? Won't they take our business? Uh, should we not protect our turf? And there have even been court cases in our respective East African countries in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, about admission of lawyers who have trained or practiced in a fellow uh, country, in a neighboring country. And so it seems that at the general level, the professionals, uh, at least in the legal profession and to a lesser extent in other professions. In the building uh, sector, there is greater interchange of professionals, architects from one country going to design a house in another country, but they need to have a local architect or the engineer needs to work with a partner, registered engineer in the different countries. But there is a sense in which uh, we, 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 we desire the benefits of a joint market, but we are apprehensive about losing monopoly or exclusivity in the countries that we currently have through our professional uh, uh, statutes that give us exclusivity. And the whole concept of the professional is that they are given a monopoly by the laws of their country. Even my human resource professional uh, the law says no one else who is, who is not registered can offer human resource advice. In return, the professional is meant to be continuously improving themselves, offering quality service, and trying to, to deal with issues of access, to uh, economic access to services. 
But what has tended to happen is that our professionals, including legal practitioners, we enjoy the exclusivity because we view it as a way in which we can charge a bit more without competition from what we view as lower quality services offered by uh, those who are not regulated. And that mentality of monopoly then affects the geographical boundaries, the, the lowering of the geographical boundaries in matters of professional engagement. In regard to the business community, there is again that kind of like schizophrenic uh, attitude to regional integration. You find at the level of the multinational businesses and so on, there's a desire to move from one country to the other. Uh, to create a common market uh, in East Africa. And then at the level of the, of the traders, there's also, they also keep going to their national governments and saying, can you protect us? Uh, bananas from Uganda are cheap. Uh, this product from Kenya is uh, uh, competing favorably with our product and so on. Can we, will we allow sugar from Tanzania? So, so there's almost like a schizophrenic, a engagement in which the traders want to benefit from an open market, but the moment the competition from traders or business community of a different country seems to uh, affect our ability in our own country to com compete effectively, we start asking our government to raise the barriers of entry. And then when it comes to Wanjiku, the, the common resident of the East African community, uh, they are a bit bemused when they hear that uh, the summit of the East African community is looking for political integration. And they wonder, is this for real? Or is this just um, something that is a dream? It is just uh, not realistic when they're looking for political integration, the, the residents of the East African community, especially the original countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, remember the breakup in 1977. And they wonder, are we serious when we talk of monetary union? When we look at what happened in European Union, the, the level of discipline that is required at economic level to set up criteria for inflation, for tax GDP ratio and other metrics of economic performance so that a monetary union can be effective. They wonder, are the nations of East Africa disciplined enough to avoid printing currency once you have a common monetary union? When we talk even about the issue of a common market and a customs union, even the World Bank has raised question marks and asked themselves, is it possible for a country to be part of one exclusive customs union like East African community, either with zero tariffs uh, internally and with common external tariffs, and at the same time belong to another customs union like SADC, South African Development Corporation, which is the case of, of, sorry, community, which is the case of Tanzania. Can they be in both? Won't, they, won't the goods in the whole of SADC come to Tanzania and then from Tanzania enter East Africa without payment of uh, common external tariffs? Are we honoring the rules about uh, the level of external destin external uh, source of goods and internal uh, kind of like level of input into the goods before they are considered East African community goods. So the, the perspective of the common residents is that the East African community is a mixed bag. There are pros and cons. We look forward to the more than 200 million, I think we're approaching 400 million uh, population potential of the East African community as a market. We look forward to that potential. But at the same time, we are trying to avoid the localized problems in each East African community country. Uh, the most recent uh, entrant into the East African community, Somalia, 
is a country that has had challenges of establishing uh, an effective central government that covers the entire country. And they already have been having for a long time a disagreement with Somaliland, which is a, a southern part of Somalia. And the international community has refused to recognize Somaliland as a different country. Uh, and so Somaliland is recognized as part of Somalia. But the people of Somaliland do not consider themselves as part of Somalia. And they are having completely different government economic arrangements. How, how do we deal with this issue? Um, when last year I traveled to the border post of uh, Mandera, uh, I found myself in a town which has two international uh, borders, one with uh, Somalia and one with Ethiopia. And uh, Somalia and Ethiopia, Ethiopia is not yet in the East African community, even though it is expected that they are going to join soon. Uh, and Somalia and Ethiopia don't have direct relations uh, there because they, they are three countries sharing the same uh, border, uh, kind of like the three borders are coming together. But any goods from Somalia to Ethiopia and vice versa have to go through Kenya because of a certain a conflict uh, or rivalry between uh, these countries and suspicion. And the question is, uh, we have been having those kind of challenges in the Great Lakes region uh, between uh, Rwanda and Uganda for a long time. The border has been closed between the countries. There's been a lot of political and military contestation between uh, the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, Rwanda on one hand and Uganda as well. So this kind of like situation uh, seems to be the reality of the East African community. And it is to be expected that uh, all uh, regional integration blocks will face challenges of one kind or the other. I think when we compare the East African community to other integration blocks in Africa and uh, in other parts of the world, we are trying to see what is the level of efficacy or effectiveness in dealing with the different challenges we face in the various East African countries. And I feel uh, the perspective of the legal practitioners, the business community and the common residents is that the whole experiment of the East African community is very heavily dependent on the relationships among the heads of state and government that form part of the summit of the East African community. And that all the other organs, uh, all the other institutions, their ability to engage uh, is based really on the relationships from time to time of the uh, presidents or the prime ministers who form part of the summit. Before I conclude, so Mr. Kajama, just sorry, just to, sorry to cut you short, uh, senior counsel, but I think you do make a very good point that was alluded to by his worship about, you know, the progress of the ESC and that it largely depends on the political goodwill of the day, right? The relationship between the head of states. Now, from a practical perspective, do you have any, can you think, I know this is a bit of an ambush, but do you think there's a way of moving out of that? Or is it that this is a situation that we find ourselves in permanently? Okay, so uh, as I answer that question, Faith, which is a good question, I wanted to make reference to Article 5 of the treaty, uh, which uh, has indicated the main objective of the community being to widen and deepen cooperation in political, economic, social, and cultural fields, research and technology, defense, security, legal, and judicial affairs. It is a real wide array of areas where we are hoping to benefit. And the East African Community Treaty says that the integration should not just be at the level of the heads of state, but at the level of the residents of the country, the business community, the professionals, and so on. In fact, the preamble to the East African Community Treaty says 
that the previous treaty, uh, some of the reasons that contributed to the collapse that are recognized in the new treaty was lack of strong political will, number one, lack of strong participation of the private sector and civil society in the co cooperation activities, number two, and number three, continued disproportionate sharing of benefits uh, of the community among partner states. So it's clear that if the cooperation of East African community is driven almost wholly by the relationship of the heads of states, then it is going to be precarious and we can learn from the history of the previous treaty. And when you look at other uh, successful regional blocks of integration, I'd like to refer to the European Union. They, they have created mechanisms where there's free movement of people, of goods and of services, so that even when at the political level, there is a bit of, of contention, the peoples in those countries, they influence their political leadership, they are integrated amongst themselves, they've created a common European identity that can then withstand the winds of politics, the winds of occasional military differences and so on. And that is why even when the UK was going through the referendum to exit from the European Union, there was so much resistance, even within the United Kingdom itself. But I feel in East Africa at the moment, the, the, the rest of the body of the countries, the civil society, the professional organizations, the, the, the common man and woman have not yet invested sufficiently in the East African community. And even the border communities that exist on both sides of the respective borders of the East African community countries, they seem to be comfortable with the ability to either pass through unregulated uh, points, uh, border points, and move from one country to the other, uh, this is what we can benefit from Uganda, this one from Tanzania, this one from uh, DRC, this one from Rwanda. They, they, they are not viewing the whole project holistically. They just view their own ability to move from one place to the other. And they are, they are able to negotiate local challenges so that they can move from one country to the other. So I feel definitely that is one of the gaps that needs to be resolved and it needs to be driven by political, sorry, by professional organization, civil society and other um, resident or citizen led initiatives. Thank you so much. So the different stakeholders have a role to play in just making sure that we are going towards the right direction. So Mr. John Kalis, I can see your hand up. Do you have a reaction, maybe a quick reaction to Mr. Kanjama's remarks? I can see your, your, your hand, Mr. John Kalisa, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you very well, Face, and I, I wanted to thank the, my co-panelists uh, for raising that issue. I think that is the, where the problem is, where the problem lies. The ability to engage, uh, we seem, it seems that uh, all other institutions lie on the mercy of the heads of state. So I wanted, uh, if you look at the East African Business Council, we are only given observer status. Uh, the same for the civil society. When you have an observer status, it means that uh, you, your inputs is limited. Your input to the uh, to influence the decisions by head of state, by council of minister are very limited. So I wanted just to hear from him what power is given to private sector, what power is given to civil society. And the, the, the treaty is very clear, but uh, it, it seems that politicians have hijacked the community. So I wanted him to generally comment on that. Thank you so much. So I'll ask Mr. Uh, Senior Counsel Mr. Kanjama just to hold on to that question. When he's coming to speak for the second time, I'll ask you that if you can kindly start 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 with that question. So just before I go to to Miss Caroline uh, Asimo, eh, I, I quickly want to go back to his worship. Uh, if, uh, your worship, if you can hear me. I mean, there, there's a question that came in that I think it's 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 a good time for us to to address it before we go on. So we have highlighted, you know, challenges. We have highlighted the gaps, and the comment that came in is, I mean, it has been 24 years since the inception of the EAC. We started with three countries. We are now eight countries, and we're about to get to nine. 
if Ethiopia joins the ranks of EAC. But the, the remarks I'm getting from the chat box is that the progress is so slow. It is so painful, right? So the question they're asking is, the question that our, our participants are interested in knowing is how can we fast track the progress? How, what do we need to do to see the realization of the objectives so that we don't have to take another 24 years before we, we have very minimal successes. Over to you, His Worship. Yes, uh, Faith, progress is indeed painfully slow. This is because, if I may put it this way, there's a speed governor that the partner states have. And it is only them who can temper with that speed governor for the speed to move. And one way of doing that is to go back to this protocol on decision making. Unless we do away with that protocol or amend it, then we remain there, we'll get stuck there. It's like a, it's like a car is stuck and the engine has been removed, the wheels have been removed. Seriously enough, as I said, that very protocol on decision making saying one of the things that you must have consensus on is the amendment of a protocol. So even to amend that protocol itself, you will need consensus. And now we are talking of eight people how easy is it to get them to come to a consensus on that it may be easy if the problem is affecting them is really affecting them sometimes i think was it in 2018 we had a summit some of you remember in uh, arusha and all heads of states flew in when we were just about to start one head of state was missing and the meeting aborted look at that because the ctc was telling him look your excellency you have no quorum you cannot sit because the quorum says all of them must be there. Now, to amend that, you need consensus to amend that issue of quorum, all of them. And I remember the president of, the, of, 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 of Uganda was so mad about it, saying these rules, we have them to facilitate us, but now they have, we have become prisoners of our own rules. Something must be done. I was very happy thinking now we have an opportunity to amend this. I'm sure they're going to bring it up. But they went, went back to their comfort zone, and it has remained that up to now. So we are stuck there. Unless that is done, we, we won't move. That's why I said, because the last amendment was because there was a crisis. We need another crisis. That was a very good crisis that had presented itself. But the partner states never took it up. Why? Because the treaty says only a partner states can propose an amendment. When it should have been saying maybe any resident. Had it been saying any resident or any NGO, maybe some people would have picked it up and said, now look. Heads of state have come, the meeting has aborted, a lot of money has been wasted, nothing has happened. We need to amend this so that in the future, if one or two heads of state are not there, the meeting can still go ahead, decisions can be taken, and they'll be taken to be decisions of the summit. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. So, um, Honorable uh, Abdullah, when I come to you, I'll, I'll just want to hear from a legislative perspective. I know you're sitting at the East Africa, the East Africa Legislative Assembly, just on the issue of amendment. So, we have a big question that we put to our panelists. We have a big question that we put to our attendees. How do we get the partner states to amend the treaty? A clear case has actually been made on the area, specific area that we need to amend, including the simple, you know, article that needs all eight partner states on consensus, not a majority vote, consensus before amending anything on the treaty. So we continue getting your, your views, your remarks, your reactions on the question, how do we get the partner states to amend? Now, just continuing and elaborating further on the challenges and, and gaps. So I'm coming to you, Ms. Caroline, uh, Dr. Caroline Asimo. Dr. Caroline Asimo, if you can hear me, Yes, I can hear you. I Great. Hear you. So, yeah. so, so we do acknowledge because, as you say, we are, we are coming from three states. We are now eight states, member states, and you're about to get to nine states if Ethiopia gets to join the ESC. Now, we do acknowledge with these dynamics that we have, the, we have you know, the unique cultural heritage and customs from each of the eight partner states, right? We also have significant socioeconomic disparities among the member states. Now, with the Ethiopia likely to join to join in the complexity on issue of talk about linguistics, talk about the cultural you know differences, talk about social economic differences. In my view, they will only intensify. Now, can you elaborate from where you sit how these differences, in your view, impact the harmonization of the policy, impact the integration agenda and cooperation, please? Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Faith. 
Uh, indeed, as you have said, we are now a big community, eight partner states with different cultural backgrounds. But uh, one thing we have to recognize as uh, it was highlighted at the beginning in the treaty, it recognizes the cultural aspects and um, it recognizes that we are different and in different partner states, but we are united through some aspects that we have to consider, especially the geographical and cultural aspects as Africans. And if I want to be more specific, I'll get to the aspect of language. Uh, in, in Africa generally, and in East Africa in particular, it is uh, one of the questions that have really been controversial because it brings on a debate that comes especially with the language choice that the, of, of what which language can be used, involvement and use. And this has always been framed on different issues, policy, practice, arguing on which language can be used because the issue or the challenge at hand is the languages have been conflicting over power, role, and status, considering that we have foreign, we have indigenous, then we have official, we have national, which languages are we giving that status? And we must uh, acknowledge that our treaty recognizes, uh, in Article 137, recognizes English as the official language of the community, and 137.2 recognizes Kiswahili as a lingua franca. But the 21st summit of our heads of states adopted Kiswahili and French alongside English as official languages of the community. So among the issues that are also pending amendment are the issue of amending Article 137 to recognize uh, the official languages as, as they are in the community now. But generally, there is that controversy of our cultural heritage, our cultural aspects, because language is part of culture and it touches people's lives. And when we are talking about this, it is something that becomes sensitive and emotive. How are we approaching uh, this aspect at both national and regional levels? We must acknowledge that the status of Kiswahili uh, has been elevated at different levels. If I can start at the global level, uh, UNESCO, which is a, a UN institution, has recognized Kiswahili and set aside the 7th of July as a special day to celebrate Kiswahili worldwide. It is an official language, working language at African Union. It is an official language at the East African community. It is an official language at SADC. And in our partner states, it is either an official language or a national language and official either first or second or third or fourth and in, uh, in addition to other languages that are used in those particular language or in those particular partner states. But if I can allude to what the previous speakers were mentioning, when it comes to communicating the integration agenda, we have a challenge because we do not have a common medium of communication and the communication agenda is not known to the citizens. I do not know, uh, like when they were talking about the tariff barriers and uh, for the traders, I don't know if most of them understand what those things mean that they are being told about. If I can take an example, most of us even go to the banks to get loans. We are given forms where an officer marks for you, sign here, sign here, sign here. And then they say, the officer has explained to you in a language you understand and you have signed. But how many of us say, understand those forms that we sign? Remember, we are in a region where we are moving, considering the, some of the integration pillars. If we can, for example, look at the customs union, if we can look at the common market, where we are supposed to be having free trade and a customs union, do we understand those uh, uh, guidelines that are supposed to take us through that? If we look at the common market, we have free movement of persons, free movement of labor, uh, free movement of uh, uh, right to establishment, right of residence, or you have maybe uh, free movement of capital and all that. How do we communicate with the people we integrate or we meet with in the different uh, communities? Uh, when it comes to the issue of implementation, now it comes to whatever has been put, the political will is there, the heads of state have adopted, the Council of Ministers, yes, has adopted. What are we doing as citizens to embrace what has been uh, brought to us? Definitely, steps are being taken at different levels, especially with uh, the implementing 
bodies, if I can, for example, speak on the behalf on behalf of the East African Kiswahili Commission, the directive was we work with partner states on modalities on how we can implement the uh, we start the process of implementing uh, or having Kiswahili as an official language of the community. But what do we do as individuals? And remember, this is to strategically position our citizens for opportunities that come with the languages within the community. When it comes to opportunities from outside, either within or outside, how do we strategically position our citizens? We have a shared culture, we have a shared history that brings us together. So sharing that culture and linguistic heritage is something that unites us. But how do we now embrace it? Considering that we have our indigenous languages, because in our countries we speak different languages. Then we have our national languages, we have the official languages, which we have to promote. And considering that globally now we are in a multilingual situation where multilingualism is the, is the norm of the day because the languages have to coexist, they have to live with each other, and for development, business, and trade, we need these languages. Even for access to social services, access to justice. If I'm traveling and I'm in another country and I need to access health services, how will I do or get that access? We have the shared geographical space. Definitely, that's what brings us together as partner states, because we are neighbors. It is something that we need to look at. Economic activities. Even the political history, because most of us or of the partner states share the colonial and post-colonial systems in the governance. So when it comes to the cultural and social aspects, there are critical and sensitive issues that need to be uh, implemented, that need to be considered. And I must say that as citizens, we also have a role to play in addition to what is provided for in the treaty. So what has been provided and what we are doing as citizens, how are we now also uh, assessing ourselves and what needs to be done? I can give an example of uh, when it comes to, for example, the legal frameworks that we have, we also have uh, national laws. I have to also re refer to what my colleagues were saying. Uh, languages have policies where they are being used. The language policy in general, how language is used in different domains, and then we have the language policy in education, the language of instruction, the language of uh, whether the subject is taught by a language is taught as a subject, whether it is taught as a foreign language, whether it is taught as an indigenous language, depending on that. We have those policies. And now when it comes to implementation, uh, we have to go through steps. And the steps are taken at different levels because partner states have their different uh, capacities at different levels. And when, when it comes to implementation, there are also capacities of human resource, even capital, because uh, someone will say we shall implement, but when the available funds are there. So it becomes something that we can note, or the East African community can note, it remains at the partner state level. So as we're saying, what we do, we citizens as beneficiaries, we need the service, but sometimes we have the legal frameworks uh, that tie us, but the efforts are there to guide us on the way forward. And uh, maybe if I can uh, mention something to end with, um, we need to do sensitization and awareness creation. One, on the fact that language is a key factor in regional integration. You cannot disseminate or you cannot pass on the integration agenda without communication. And you cannot communicate without language. And you cannot just use the language. You need a common language that is understood by people. And you need to sensitize the masses to know that a common language is to facilitate the integration agenda while we also preserve our indigenous and national languages for their national, for our national prestige and for preservation of our culture. We also need the international languages for what comes with it. And then the linguistic, the common linguistic identities of having our languages coexisting with these other languages and complementing each other, we need to accept it because it contributes to the growth of the languages and it spreads our culture 
and we appreciate each other. Though we speak different languages, we are the same people and working towards a common, a common goal. And lastly, but not least, is the region's need for a vibrant lesson on the politics of decolonization. We are not divided by our own means. We are divided by colonial purpose that still dominates us up to now. Because I must say that coming together is not a, an act of harnessing, eh? is not only an act of harnessing our commonalities to benefit us, but an act of a revolution to decolonize our, communi our communities and give them new hope. So it's up to us now to think of development support communication. How are we going to communicate the integration agenda to have everyone on board? Even if we have the civil society, even if we have everyone on board, we need to first bring down the integration agenda to the people because the community concerns us all, not people at a certain level or at a higher level. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Caroline. We really appreciate. So I think key things are coming up from coming out clearly from our first speaker, his worship, Ripinalis Okubo told us you cannot talk about ESC integration without appreciating the role that the East Africa Court of Justice plays. Uh, Senior Counsel Mr. Kanjama, you know, uh, told us that the private sector, the civil society, the common residents or the ordinary residents of the ESC, they are the main drivers of they should be the main drivers of of, of economic uh, of regional integration. And now from Dr. Caroline uh, Asimwe, with, I think the big point she's made is that you cannot talk about integration. It's not possible for us to talk about regional integration without effective communication. Effective communication goes back to the language. So he's given us a different perspective from the from from the past, the, uh, highlighting the challenges that you are facing from the cultural, linguistic, and social economic differences. Now at this point. I'll call on, on um, the Honorable Dr. Abdullah. If you can hear me kindly, switch on your video. And the Honorable Dr. Abdullah, before you just, uh, you know, uh, go into the, 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 your thoughts or your views on the topic of the day that you want to share with us, I just want to start by asking, by just posing to you a question that has been posted on the, on the chat box. And this is tied closely to, to some comments made earlier that, that we have progress uh, in our community, but the, the progress we have seen is painfully slow, considering that it has been 24 years since the inception of the East Africa community. So the question that has been posed is, do we have timelines under the treaty for the implementation of the various you know, pillars of, of, of integration? Do we have timelines? And if we have these timelines, are these timelines being followed? And if these timelines are not being followed, what could be the issue? And what maybe proposal do we have um, to give to, to, to the community so that we see um, us advancing forward? Karibu sana. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, for, for the floor. And I'd like to really thank the conveners for convening this important uh, dialogue. Uh, it is very important that uh, East Africans, from time to time, gather together and reflect on the matters of the ESC integration, which is very important for all of us. Uh, now, uh, answering, responding to the question you've asked about uh, this, the implementation of the treaty, I would say uh, the only item which has a timeline and that the, time, uh, the timeline was provided for is the customs union. And uh, we had a timeline for negotiation and starting to implement it. But, uh, as soon as we had completed the negotiations of the customs union and uh, the customs union had uh, taken the legal force that was in 1st of January 2005, then uh, the partner states started uh, being or uh, aspiring higher in terms of negotiations because uh, they went to negotiate on the issue of the APAS. They went to admit new partner states. Uh, and then also they went to negotiate in the in the common market. While they are supposed to implement the customs union, but not only to implement, uh, to do something called monitoring and evaluation. You know, if they say the Englishmen, they say where you don't expect, where you do not inspect, do not oh. expect. So 
what we were supposed to do first of all was to track the implementation of the customs union. How are we doing? But a confusion came at that highest level because uh, we were to, the, the 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 decision to negotiate co common market, and that was uh, there were three items that I pointed out earlier. Now. The common market came into conclusion, negotiations were concluded in uh, 2009. And um, the common market itself entered into legal force in 2010, first of July. And uh, if you go and look at the implementation of the common market, I'm very sorry to say, but that is the truth, it's zero. And uh, rather than starting to implement the common market, on the date, yes, you, you won't believe it, but it's the truth. On the on the same sitting that concluded the negotiations of the common market, and when they said they said now we are signing this one, they set a date to commence the negotiations of the monetary union. Now we are we are, we, are, we are becoming experts, or rather chiefs of negotiating, rather than implementing. The East Africans want action, not talks. So we went into the monetary union, and uh, during the negotiation of the monetary union, as this was noted, so in it was purposely designed that Article Five of the of the monetary union should uh, should say the prerequisites of the monetary union, and the first one would be uh, to have completely to to, to have complete implementation or full implementation of the customs unions and the common market. And uh, they set a 10 years timeline. And uh, this is through 2024. This is when we were supposed to commence the monetary union, but they reviewed it later. So you see, you set your own target and you don't achieve it. And then you shift it later. And then you, without addressing the cause, because the cause is implementation of the customs union and the common market. Hmm. But they don't, they haven't done that. And uh, I can assure you, with this pace we are going, when come, come 2032, they'll shift it maybe to 2050. Because we won't have achieved anything. Wow. And wow. Why I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, saying okay. so, yes. because I've spoken this matter very much in very various forums. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Thank uh, you so much for your, no, no, for your response. Just, 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 just one thing. Just one thing. Sure, sure. sure. And this one is, uh, it, it touches the, the interest of uh, my brother, Kalisa, from the East African Business Council, and the, by extension to all of us. You know, the first thing is uh, we're supposed to have the customs union. And the customs union, for it to work, each, every East African you're listening who is lamenting about the, the implementation of the customs union and the community is on non-tariff barriers. We always talk about Article 24 of the customs union protocol, which calls for the establishment of the Committee of Trade and Remedies of the ESC. Imagine, this committee was supposed to be, to be established on 1st January, the year 2005, when the customs union entered into force. It is now 19 years later, it hasn't come into force. And without that committee, Whatever efforts are being done to implement the common the customs union cannot really achieve the implementation of the customs union as planned and desired. So what we are, what are we doing? We are just rocking here, but uh, nothing is happening. So uh, really at this juncture, end here because to give time for others to, to talk, but I have so much to talk and I, I believe I'll get some opportunity at a later time to add more. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Abdullah. I think it's still your time. It's only that I wanted just just to shift to to, to the to, to another topic that I know you you you're going to 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 help us, you know, just un, 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 unpack it as well. So because the discussions that we've had from the first speaker and just to your remarks a few seconds ago, there's so much inward inward looking. So we are looking at you know our region. What is it that you're doing? What is it that we, we are not doing? So my, my question that I want us to discuss at this point is, in your view, for example, do we have like, you know, global trends, emerging trends at a global level, at a regional level, maybe at a continental level, 
you know that that will that will necessitate necessitate us to reevaluate the treaty provision do you think the emerging trends at the global level that we need to look at and say this is actually a time for us to reevaluate the treaty provisions that we have what i can tell you well, is maybe, uh, so 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 maybe much maybe is happening maybe. Yes, Mr. John Kalisa, we'll come to you. Just let let's just the honourable no, doctor. I wanted I wanted him to respond to the same question uh, okay. in terms of um in terms of the timeline, but also the the target set. Hmm? Uh, it seems that uh, and I think one of the panelists asked about the timelines, and are they rules are they rules governing or sanction non compliance? Uh, because as you rightly put it, there was a roadmap agreed. But this roadmap is not followed up. So, are they uh, rules that sanction for uh, sanctions non compliance? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, I can uh, come back and uh, start. Uh, can you just remind me, Faith, what you spoke about? What was your question? Yeah. Because. Uh, Sure, sure, no problem. So, so I was saying, I, I, I mean, um, I mean, we live in a globe, right? We don't just live in isolation. We live within the continent, and we live, we live within the 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 the, the global village, as it were. So, in your mm -hmm. view, where you sit, where you, where you sit, you know, as a legislature at the East Africa Legislative Assembly, have you seen or have you considered maybe emerging trends, you know, dynamics, developments that may necessitate us to reevaluate the treaty provisions that we have? Because we've actually highlighted, you know, from the first speaker, we've actually seen, you know, highlights about some of the treaty provisions that are considered, you know, uh, uh, that should actually be, be considered for amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, what I can tell you is um, so much has happened in the world and locally, regionally, internationally, even in the issue of uh, COVID-19. These are things which are very important and uh, would have informed us to behave differently and even achieve uh, or they operate differently. Have, I mean, a way that we want to achieve our goals, improve or see how we can achieve them. But uh, unfortunately, you know, the problem I can tell you straight is that uh, what, from what it is supposed to be, and by the design of the Treaty of the East African Community, is that the Council of Ministers is supposed to be the one which is steering the operations and the strategic direction of the community. Of course, the summit is the one which gives, gives the political impetus. But the Council is the one which is there, the steward. It's a day to day. But uh, what we can see is uh, the Council has. disowned that uh, that role the council is considering each council member is a cabinet minister in or in his or her own partner state so the per capita they, they consider their partner state matters domestically from their capitals and uh, they've given less attention to the integration business at the community and uh, that has been done gradually. I can give that as a testimony. You know, in Iala, we have seats. And when we're sitting, the council members are supposed to come and sit with the members so that they sit on the front bench as the government. I can tell you, we sometimes have one member. And that is most of the times. Sometimes we get two. And uh, Sometimes even we got none and we couldn't transact. We had to cause them to come in. So when the council, who are the persons who are supposed to be responsible with the steering of the business of the community, absent themselves deliberately and knowingly, even in the matters which are very crucial, like the budget, then it means that... Uh, who are supposed to be given the stewardship and the direction have chickened out. They are not there. They are supposed to be the fathers of the baby, 
but th this baby has no father. And uh, that is very sad because uh, it is uh, something which uh, the council is doing. And uh, what we can say is the council has taken, now has gone to the back seat and the driver's seat has been taken by the technocrats. And when you, are, you, are, you, are, you want to steer up, because the, I had the, the panelists speaking here and they were saying, we need a political goodwill and political will. Now the council are the politicians and uh, there's the ones who are supposed to brief the summit. But if they're not there, then they rely fully on the updates and the guidance from the technocrats. So this community is not is is, is called so-called a political community, but it is being driven by technocrats. And that is very sad because when you have bureaucracy and techni technical arguments steering this community, it means now that is why, as I pointed out earlier, we're having 19 years and we haven't established a very crucial committee, the Committee on Trade and Remedies. And also to respond to the issue uh, brought forward by my brother, uh, Kalisa, from the East African Business Council, on the issue of, of sanctions, he would like to interest himself with Article Provision Number 143 of the treaty, which says uh, sanctions, okay, and uh, Provision 146 of the treaty, which says suspension of members or of, of a member, and uh, Article 147 of the treaty, which talks about expulsion of a member. But I would also give it a rider, and which is a rider is all these are supposed to be implemented upon recommendation of the council to the summit. And uh, one of them is on the issue of uh, members honoring their financial obligations in terms of contribution to the budget. Because this community, we said we want to have our own community because we want to depend on ourselves to create a regional market to produce our goods and to consume our goods. Like the way those advanced, uh, advanced uh, integrations are doing, like they, they in Europe, they are trade in inter European trade is more than 70 percent, inter American trade is more than 60 percent, but inter East African trade is less than 15 percent. What we said is we want to, to be self dependent, so we have to contribute to our budget. We shouldn't be depending on part on uh, donors and other people, other, other supporters. But now, partner states are joining and they are not honoring their budget. We are having partner states which which requested to be to be to be waived their contribution after failing to pay contribution for more than a couple couple of couple of years. We are having partner states who are who joined and they have not paid even a single cent up to date. We are having partner states which are we can see they are committed, but uh, they are struggling to honor their payment because they are trying to pay, but they remit. Uh, just a dot or a drop in the ocean. So we are saying uh, partnerships which are falling back 18 months and beyond as per, per the provisions of the treaty, they should be sanctioned. And this matter was brought uh, by the assembly. It was a motion was moved in the assembly. It was taken by the council to the summit, but no decision was taken. They couldn't sanction. So what we are saying is, um, they they tend to shy away in implementing these sanctions, and uh, they say the reason from at least in the past we say the reason was given is that we should move together, we should not you know, uh, we should be diplomatic. But diplo being moving together, being diplomatic, the reason why we have the treaty is because it is the one which is supposed to guide our business, and. Uh, Having said that, I think uh, I've responded to the question. Absolutely. But uh, but also allow me to to pronounce on the issue of the protocol decision making. Yes, which you was can uh, also do that. Yes. You yeah, can that was raised. That, that was raised yes. again by by his worship. Yes. You know the problem of the protocol decision making is that um, 
1977, when this committee co collapsed, they said we should have uh, like a veto for partner states so that they all have, they're, they're all on board and they, we're moving with them. They, the partner states make a point and then we move together. They should also nod yes and then we're moving. But um, so that is okay. If uh, the consensus is that we should have eight, okay, no problem. But it shouldn't be the reason to make us not achieve our objectives. If we are supposed to make a decision together, then someone, we have, we're having six partner sets in the venue, one partner set absenting or dodging the meeting, then we should have consequences. Because you can't have heads of state have already congregated somewhere, and then one head of state just absents himself or herself. At least, you know, but uh, I think, again, probably it's an issue of coordination and communication and uh, sharing the information. At times, you know, these things need to be looked into from the wider, from the wider scope. Uh, let me end there. And uh, probably if I get some more time, I'll, I'll uh, share more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, the Honorable Dr. Abdullah. Thank you so much for sharing with us your insights from a legislative perspective. Some of us, we may not be able to understand the politics that happens at the East Africa Legislative Assembly. And just thank you for, for letting us in. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Senior Counsel, uh, Mr. Kanjama, if you can hear me kindly. Mr. Kanjama, if you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, 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 so um, Council, I just want you just to shed light a little bit on this issue. I mean, we live in a rapidly uh, global landscape, right? And we've seen external factors. I mean, climate change has become a topic of the day discussions. You've seen governments taking up actions at, at, at a national level, at the ESC level, there are some proposed policies, ETC. Now, in your view, such things like climate change, you know, transnational crime, global, uh, global uh, pandemics, do you think these issues, the treaty that we have, do you think it poses so such challenges adequately? Or do we need to make amendments to ensure that it covers these challenges that keep on evolving? Uh, okay, so uh, my answer to the question will be brief. There have already been comments about the inadequacy of the treaty on structural level uh, because of issues like the need for consensus at the summit, uh, at the council, at the coordination committee. So there have been those challenges that uh, would require amendment of the treaty. And I fully uh, adopt and uh, reiterate those uh, explanations that were given by one of our panelists who started off the session. On the question of uh, climate change and transnational crimes, on the question of pandemics like the coronavirus uh, pandemic, I don't think those issues necessarily require amendment of the treaty. And the reason I'm saying this is because regional integration treaties provide for protocols, the possibility of parties uh, adopting protocols to deal with emerging issues. And when you do benchmarking with uh, other regional integration treaties, if, and, and maybe we put the European Union Treaty at the top because they have achieved the highest level of integration. And then we look at the treaties for Inter-America, uh, for other regions, and we, we put them on a scale. The treaties have not needed to be amended because of emerging issues. And one of the reasons is because the process of amendment of this uh, regional economic or integration treaties, one, always takes a substantial amount of time because it requires organs within each of the member states 
and then the organs of the the multilateral bodies that are part of the current treaty to be engaged so it tends to take time it cannot be done quick enough to respond to emerging issues number 2 as has been stated the level of consensus required even if you 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 remove it from consensus and you say we we are going to take a majority is always super majority 70 80% when there has been the movement for example from the 1992 treaty of the european community from the previous treaty to the one of 1992 to the subsequent ones they have needed to get almost consensus in each of the countries uh, member states of that regional integration treaty so even though i recognize the need for the east african community to be flexible enough to take into account emerging issues my recommendation is that those emerging issues need to be dealt with through a framework of additional protocols we have seen this with the african charter for human and people's rights when they thought of creating the maputo protocol on matters of uh, rights of women and so on gender related matters they did not go back to start amending the charter itself so i think uh, just to conclude on this point issues of climate change transnational crime and global pandemics are relevant the east african community treaty when you look at the foundational provisions it is very wide ranging in terms of the intention to deal with all kind of matters political economic social uh, environmental it is very wide ranging human rights it's already stated it at a foundational level the additional detailing now needs to be done through uh, protocols which would then be a way of supplementing the core provisions of the treaty thank you so much and, and, and i do agree with that and just seeing at the comments on the on the chat box from our attendees they we all tend to agree with that i agree with you that we don't need to necessarily amend our treaty to deal with the emerging issues we can deal with them with uh, them through protocols through regional policies so that we don't have partner states not doing nothing about these uh, emerging issues on the premise that they can't do you know something because they haven't amended the protocol what we're establishing is we have alternative forums and the partner states will be able to take advantage of those alternative avenues to start you know actioning where they haven't start actioning on these emerging issues for example climate change thank you so much senior council now um mr john uh bosco Kaliso, i will uh, Kaliso, i'll just cross over to you i mean we have extensively looked at the challenges that are emerging you know in this journey of you know regional integration uh, economic cooperation etc now from a private sector perspective right do you have some of you know proposals or solutions or just recommendations of the reforms to to the ESC treaty that maybe you 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 the members of the East Africa Business Council community will want to see implemented. So if you can if you can please share with us your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Faith. And uh, I want to first of all thank uh, eminent uh, eminent panelists uh, who have uh, spoken before me. And also congratulate uh, the crafters of the uh, treaty um, because they provided a voice, a strong voice for private sector and the civil society in the integration agenda. So when you look at the, the treaty for the establishment of East African community, it does emphasize people-centered, market-driven and private sector-led integration process uh, to accelerate economic growth, uh, creating wealth and reducing poverty. And I wanted to share with you that uh, despite the challenges uh, that have been uh, highlighted, but we are still the best performing economic community. We are the fastest, we are the fastest growing regional economic communities among eight, eight recognized.
colonized lakes by African Union. And in, in all aspects, it's in all its movement of persons, uh, issues of trade, issues of investment. Currently, we are posting an average Uganda 6, Kenya 5.8. It is the only region that is really doing well in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, integration, uh, despite uh, issues that I have been highlighted. So I think uh, we need to embrace uh, so far. We embrace the impressive growth we've registered so far. And we need to deepen. We need to deepen as we've widened the integration, but we need to deepen it further. Deepening it further is to give a strong voice to the private sector because wealth creation is created by the private sector. And that is clearly articulated within the treaty. So we need to restore, give a uh, imaginary sink and give the, the position to the private sector and civil society uh, within our treaty. And I think it is, it is very, very, very important that uh, we really, uh, that's why I highlighted that uh, do we have uh, the roadmap, and we do have the roadmap. When you look at the the the, the pillars of a, uh, of yes integration, customs union, we did very well within the customs union. But uh, there are still areas that we need to uh, deepen, uh, including uh, uh, implementation of single customs territory, uh, deepening uniform common uh, common external tariff. But we need to shy away from stay, stays of application. These are distorting trade. Currently, when you look at the budget countries on the stay of application, I've been looking at the number. We have almost 1,000 stays of application. And we cannot trade with such a when countries are generating stays of application. So then that, that dilutes or jeopardizes the customs union implementation. Look at the custom, look at the country's specific duty emissions. We are not harmonized in some of the aspects, some of the instruments that are very critical to spur intra-regional trade. And I, I agree with everyone that uh, the intra-regional trade currently stands at 16%, given that uh, some of the implementation uh, commitment have not been done. Uh, look at the trade remedies committee. Uh, my brother, uh, Dr. Abdul highlighted, it was, it was endorsed, it was approved in a 205. 19, 19 years down the road has not never been implemented. So there is really a lack, lack of the sense of urgency in terms of our commitment. It's not about the treaty, it's about commitment and objectives by the council as well as by the heads of state. So when you go into the common market protocol, which is the second pillar of our integration, yes, we are doing well on the free movement of goods, free movement of persons, but the right of establishment, the right of residence. Countries are not uh, are not facilitating East African citizen to do business across the region. So we need to really look into those uh, provisions, uh, look at the those instruments, and ensure we uh, depend those instruments. That's how we can grow prosperity in our region. Uh, also look at the liberalization of air transport services. And I always say that uh, where I'm based in Arusha, just a ticket from Arusha to Chigari, seven hundred dollars. It is uh, it is cheaper to, to to move from Arusha to Dubai or to Europe than traveling within uh, the region, because we have not really liberalized our airspace. Uh, look at the restriction also. I mentioned the restriction uh, on the movement of persons. Look at the telecommunication one area network. Three countries already on one area network. But uh, I, I'm happy that the United Republic of Tanzania is on the piloting phase. But Burundi, uh, DRC need also to join one area network. So coming to the monetary union, of course, it has been pushed 10 years. 10 years for sure, we are not serious. Because currently, when you look at our economies, why our exchange rate uh, is losing value across the region, there are some instruments within monetary union we can implement, like uh, a common currency. Uh, the, 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 the first speaker mentioned about it. We don't have to wait for 10 years. There are certain quick wins we can draw from the protocol and start implementing them. But that can only be done eh, when the policymakers listen to the private sector, listen to the, uh, to the civil society. So I think the issue is not the treaty. The issue is the 
how best are we working in terms of implementing the instruments, uh, the, 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 the instruments within the treaty, the protocols? So finally, my view, and uh, this is my own analysis, uh, we need to look into the, I always call them three eyes, three eyes. Hmm? How are we managing the interests, political interests? That, is, that comes one. Hmm? Countries have varying interests in terms of the integration. Uh, so our ability to manage that, those interests. The second eye is incentives. The incentives, uh, uh, joining integration has to provide a certain incentives uh, for countries to see that, that well, I'm going to, to integration, but I'm committed. The third eye is institutions. We need a strong institution. I'm happy my brother from Yara and others, Yara is, and is waking up, but the institutions in the EAC are very weak, very weak, because the mandate is very clear. I sit on the university council, I sit on other community. The, the, the institution, we need to empower these institutions. These are the ones to drive the integration we want. So they need to give them the power. And I think uh, the issues of a consensus, I agree with everyone that uh, the issues of consensus is one of the, the setback within our integration. We need to scrap that completely, but also we need to empower the, the secretariat. Currently, the coordination role of the secretariat does not look at the European Union. We must transform the role of a secretariat from coordination to a commission with a clear, a clear uh, performance indicators in terms of measurement. I remember in, in 2015, we used to have a common market scorecard where we could ask, really name and shame countries that are not implementing their commitment. That has died a natural death. So we must have a clear, we must empower the secretariat, we must empower the institutions, we must ensure that the private sector and the civil society are brought back on a driving seat. Currently, the integration has become a political club. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlisa. Now, Ms. Lillian, um, Ale, Mr. Lil Ms. Lillian Alex, just coming back to you. You've heard Mr. Carlisa's views that um, the issue may not be necessarily with the provisions of the treaty, but rather on the implementation of it. And I think the Honorable Dr. Abdullah shared the same views. And I can see some comments uh, from the from the chat box uh, to, uh, towards those lines, basically. So if Ms. Lillian, if you can hear me, Ms. Lillian Alex, you can just confirm that you can hear me. Yes, Faith, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. So I just want you to, to share with us how, just apart from your perspective, how do you think that the stakeholders, the different stakeholders in this integration journey, what do you think their role will be or how can they contribute to implementing the, to helping us implement the provisions of the ESC treaty and some of the reforms that have come up? Some of the suggested reforms that has come up in the course of this discussion, please. Thank you, Faith. And once again, thank you for this um, opportunity, ELS. We really um, con um, appreciate this forum, this discussion. I think um, we're even late. We should have had it earlier or sooner. But I'm glad that today we're having this opportunity to have this discussion, which is very beautiful. I myself have been learning. And I also want to strongly appreciate his worship, um, Okubo. I think he's raised, he's quite um, addressed the issues. I think he's addressed most of the issues that we have all been thinking. And he has um, actually articulated the, um, the actual realities of how the treaty is right now and the reality of how the East Africa community is at a general. So what was asked to speak about was around the role um, of stakeholders in implementing reforms and advancing integration. And, um, you know, um, learning from the presentations that we have already had, I just wanted to also just give an highlight or an overview, and thanks to Faith for the 15 minutes. I just wanted to give an highlight of um, or overview of the citizen um, reality, because I've seen a lot of comments, people asking about citizen um, opportunities, where the citizens, I've even seen a question being asked, who, are, who is to represent the citizens? So yes, um, the East Africa Civil Society Organizations Forum has, highlighted in Article 127 is one of the arms of the um, driving, um, I can say the driving partners of the integration in the East African community together with the business sector. But um, as we're going on, I've also learned a lot from the presentations as I've said earlier, and even a question was raised here asking about the observer status um, of the civil society 
versus the um, business sector. And it's very evident business sector already has the observer status. Last time when I inquired about the observer status, um, we were told it's automatically there because we are a treaty mandate and established under the Article 127. But when it comes to reality, civil society has not even been closer to the doors um, of the ministerial councils or any decision making um, tables that are happening or taking place in the EAC. So that question brings up the whole question again about citizen participation in the region. We have had quite tumbles um, over the years. We have had quite challenges that have actually, I can say, completely pushed us off um, the inclusivity or the participation or completely, completely shut us off. And that brings me to comparisons. I've had comparisons here being spoken and clearly we've come out saying that EA, um, EAC is the most progressive block in the um, continent and we're doing a lot. And I don't dispute from that. I totally agree for, I mean, with you. But then again, let's also just reflect the same African continent and move to ECOWAS. When you speak of citizen participation, before you even go to European Union, I'm learning a lot from the ECOWAS region. I think if you're speaking of citizen participation at this point, we should just give an applause to the ECOWAS region where we have the civil society having a direct observer um, table or observer seat um, within the ECOWAS um, community. Even better, they are being supported financially and also technically by the ECOWAS community itself. So giving them the voice, but then the support even is, um, and it goes beyond that, still does not control what the civil society have um, as opinions um, in the community. Because then again, the biggest question comes, if we are being supported, then it controls the narrative of the civil society. But I'm seeing a different, um, um, a different reality with the ECOWAS region, and I thought um, we should start by learning from internally before we even move to the European Union, because often we are challenged that we are busy trying to learn from the Western world. When you're speaking of the same challenges for the civil societies, can you also go back and reflect on our main framework for civil society, our main engagement framework as stipulated back to Article 127, that um, Article 127 very well, and I was reading it here as people, were, yeah, I mean, when the presentations were going on, it specifically, is, I mean, establishes and explains how civil society should have national consultations at national levels, that is every year and things like that. But that has not been the practice. And this goes back to what, um, John Bosco has just um, said. I think we 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 are really moving to a direction to try and ask. I mean, ask for an amendment of the treaty. But in reality, we can amend it and have new policies and still don't have the proper implementation that we're expecting from the community. We have already beautiful policies that have been put in place. Let's just look at the CDF framework, for instance, that I'm speaking about that gives opportunity for the civil society and private sector to convene and engage and share recommendations. That has been quite a beautiful framework in reality, and we have been trying to discuss it and go around it. But let's look at how the outcomes of the CDF framework has actually come out to date. The recommendations that come out of there, and thanks to having ELS here and thanks to having EABC, we all know that we are all struggling. It's actually really frustrating to see that recommendations that continue continuously come out from this SGS forum have actually um, been shelved, most of them. But apart from being shelved, Itself, currently, we are, we are now counting four years of not having the SGS forum, and that questions, where's the voice of the citizen? Where's the voice of the other um, academias, experts, inst institutions that also contribute to driving the integration of the um, community? How are we checking this? And I like how they've asked the questions, the timelines of implementation. Where actually really I can say gives us a challenge a civil society community do they really value of civil um, commitment and um, along with civil society engaging at the East African region and so quickly I'll just go around the implementation of CSO led policies I've had people speak about the policies the bills that have been um, developed and thanks we also have a representative from the East Africa Legislative Assembly, and also he has spoke about the frustrations that they have at their own level when it comes to implementation. We have a number of beautiful policies, and I have to agree, I, when we are actually saying EAC is the most progressive, I think right now I'll also comment to saying that we are very good at making very beautiful policies. But when it comes to implementation, that is a whole new question. 
and I don't know how basically we are going to go around this. His worship Okubo spoke about the private member bills. Clearly, they don't go anywhere. So it's only partner states that can actually institute these bills. And so again, it goes back to the whole question of what's failing for us and what is actually working for us and feels that the community does not represent the people. And when I'm at this point, I just wanted to highlight also a question that I've just noted down as we were having these conversations and speaking to um, the issue about um, country interests that brings around. Um, and also, I wanted to reflect to the protocol on decision making that was actually being spoken very well by the legal practitioners here. And um, my question to private sector, and maybe even the legal fraternity um, experts can also contribute to this. As you're speaking about protocol on decision making, where are we with the um, different country interests where we have countries entering into international trade um, treaties and agreements um, versus other countries that do not assent or agree to that. If you're speaking of harmonization and if we're speaking of actually working as a block, where are we when it comes to that discussion? Because clearly right now we see a very disintegrated region where some partner states move ahead to make decisions and basically entering into international treaties that automatically affect the region as a whole. So I wanted to hear how the business sector would want to also respond to this at some point and just maybe share a highlight or um, advice. Because then again, I'm worried as a community, we are biting more than we can actually choose. And if we're expanding and bringing in more partner states into the party, clearly some partners still need to go through the, the whole process of orientation before we can even go into these international treaties. And then finally, I also wanted to just echo um, a few of the other challenges that we are having. And clearly, um, the issue around awareness has come up very clearly. And I liked what um, um, Dr. Caroline had um, presented about the language. And I just wanted to also highlight this and maybe pose as a question, and probably she can highlight on that or anyone in this discussion. I'm looking at the, um, the challenges we are having with language, but also somebody raised something about the education curriculum. And I remember back in the years in um, at, at, at the schools, we were being taught about the um, the EAC, some of us had to learn about the EAC when um, doing early in high school, but currently we are seeing that is not the practice in most of um, schools. And so that brings another whole question when you're speaking about integration at the cultural and um, social cultural aspects, without leaving the whole discussion that I've been seeing that we've been seeing in the national and them has to be taught in schools. But I'm sure if we turn this meeting on and ask people to sing the national anthem of the East African community, that is going to be a whole new discussion. So I just wanted to have, I mean, highlight a few challenges that civil societies we've been facing and not forgetting the whole challenge around civic space that brings a lot around our participation, both at national levels and at regional levels. We have been struggling a lot for that um, um, for that recognition. And we are seeing that now it was at national levels. At some point, we just speak it at national levels, but right now we are also moving to the regional levels. And that is why we are not having even the SGS forum for the past four years. So when you ask me of the role of stakeholders, maybe right now I just want to highlight a few and I just ask a question out to everyone. And I mean, who are the stakeholders are we talking about? Um, when you're speaking of stakeholders, who are we identifying as stakeholders to the community? In my take, I just see from the discussions we have had, the stakeholders are basically, I mean, if we if we cluster them without mentioning everyone in all the technical details, we have the government on one hand and we have the citizens on the other hand. And so then we can now define whatever we want to define within. I had a conversation once um, with one of the civil society's led actors and um, I remember his comment around the integration system and said, the EAC feels like a big boys club. And I'm worried um, he was right. As much as it really frustrated me and I wanted to challenge him and tell him, no, that's not the case. But I'm worried that is what we are at right now, not where we're headed to, but we're already there. So my issue is, let's also just define who are the stakeholders we're planning to engage at this point. If you're speaking... Um, and um, his worship Okubo really highlighted this and really um, has challenged me. If you're speaking about um, amending the bill, if the 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 protocol itself on decision making has to be decided upon amendment by the partner states themselves. So what direction are we actually going to be taking? Or right now we're just going to be running around in cycles. So I think we need to also um, um, get in, I mean, get into reality and get to see how best we try and undo the knots that are already tying us all together. So for me, the stakeholders I identified in my capacity were around the government. That's, those are the ones, the main implementers around this, and they're the ones who can actually move uh, 
and ensure that implementation of this beautiful protocol um, on the treaty itself is actually being implemented at national levels. I think the conversations we have had have clearly highlighted that. And looking at the people, the citizens themselves, and this will go to answering the question that also was left out by his, um, was it his worship or was it the legal counsel that had said what, um, what can actually be done around this? How can we go around this? And I think citizens have the power. At this point, I'll just want to highlight that we as citizens, all of us, have the power and have the voice. If we actually take the opportunity at our national levels to push our national governments to uh, amend the treaty and to um, include the, um, the, the, the articles that we are actually trying to see amended, I think this will actually move the governments to actually act according to that. So I think um, let's also leverage on the already existing power that we have and let's not ignore um, the, the driving seat that we have. So yeah, we have the private sectors, other um, stakeholders that we can work with. And um, we also have um, the different advisory institutions such as the academias. And I'm glad that we have also the East Africa Legislative Assembly here. These are some of the people that if their voices are clearly and um, uh, well um, used will actually ensure to bring in a, a lot of um, change in the community. So yes, the stakeholders are there and um, I believe as civil societies, we can begin a campaign both at national levels and at the regional levels to have the treaty amended. But let's not forget what are we amending if it's not going to be implemented. Because again, we are all frustrated here of the um, the slow implementation as Caroline had, um, and as Faith has already articulated, how slow it is. It's not moving, it's not progressive. So what best um, solution do we see out of this amendment of the treaty if already what we have has not been implemented um, to full of our expectations? So thank you, and I'd like to submit. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Lily and Alex. I think that's actually a very good neat way to wrap up the discussion, having highlighted the challenges and just coming in and telling us the different roles that the different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, play in helping us to implement and just achieve the integration agenda. Now, um, I'm, I'm getting some update from Dr. the Honorable Dr. Abdullah, if you can hear me. I understand there is an update coming in you know, uh, live from Arusha concerning the issue, the consensus issue. If if maybe Dr. Ari, if you can hear me, you can just unmute and 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 just update our 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 attendees. I think that's a very interesting um, update that all of us will be keen to hear about. Yeah, well, from what uh, I, I gathered is that the council is uh, going to adopt uh, the quorum that. Uh, now it should be simple majority rather than the whole house to be in. That is at the council. So now we are, that we're having eight members from the council, then a simple majority will be in five members to constitute quorum. And that is very good because that is what uh, a member uh, participants have been calling for, but uh, uh, it has been uh, a long thing which uh, people are talking about for many years, but now they're coming to reality and saying that, and I, I think that would uh, assist in decision-making in the ESC. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for that update. So I had given our attendees an opportunity for two of them to raise their hands for questions. So I can't see their hands up, but I've, 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 I'm just looking at the chat box. I can see most of the questions that were asked have been answered by my panelists. Thank you so much for doing that. So um, as we, as I think there's one hand up, let me just see the, who that could be. Yes, so Joseph, so I'll just allow you. So Gabriel, the technical team, if you can just... Um, Joseph can proceed to unmute. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Joseph, unmute and then you can speak, please, if you can hear us. So if Joseph is taking a while, Fatuma, go ahead. So I only have two. So Joseph and Fatuma. So Fatuma, go ahead. Unmute yourself and speak. At least I think they're having technological issues. They're still uh -huh. muted. Yes, we can hear you, Fatuma. Go ahead. I think he, I didn't raise the hand. I think it's a technology issue. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you are discussing uh, this critical issue, especially the amendment of the treaty. But most of the points have been raised by uh, Honorable Dr. Makame and also the speakers. 
who spoke before him. And I was also concerned about the issue of consensus and also quorum, because when you look at SADC, SADC in their treaty, they also have the principle of consensus and quorum, but for them, it is simple majority. So if it is done in SADC, it can also be done within the ESC. So it's good that the council is coming to that consensus. So I also wanted to engage or maybe appeal, especially to the civil society and the, the land people, the lawyers, because you know sometimes you have voices, especially the fact that you are professionals, and of course the private sector matters. Yes, it does. Because when you look at the treaty, the treaty is very explicit. We are a private sector-led community, citizen-driven. But when it comes to real practice, the community is being driven by the executive. It is the summit. Of course, we need to have the, that highest level of decision-making. It is the council. I think they are doing their role, but we really need as citizens, and of course, as the other, we represent the citizens of East Africa, we really need to hear your voices. You need to push. You have to know that you also have powers to petition, to petition either the council, the summit, or EALA on any issue, and then you can petition through, through the EALA. And I think through that, we can also be able to raise any issue especially on issues of implementation that most of you have been raising. Because we are not short of normative frameworks, we have a clear roadmap from customs to political federation, we have protocols, we have acts of the community, we have very good policies, yes, but yes. the challenge has been implementation. So I just wanted really to encourage civil society and all of you actors to push so that really ESC can be a truly citizen-driven and private sector-led community. You need to hold us accountable. Absolutely. This thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Fatuma, for sharing your vision just for the encouragement to the civil society and the other stakeholders just to step up and push. I mean, it is our region, so we have an obligation uh, you know, to push and just to to, to make sure that that, that 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 this is working. So, if I can just at least, if you can just help me to unmute Joseph Paul, Paulo, Joseph Paulo, that will be our last uh, participant to be given an opportunity just to give a comments or questions quickly. Paulo, if you can hear me, just unmute yourself from your end. So, Paolo, as, as as we do that, I think I think we need to move on in the interest of time. And at this point, uh, I think a good way of wrapping up is just to ask my panelists to give their uh, their parting shots. I mean, we have had an extensive um, an extensive discussions, you know, participation through questions through through chat. So, as we bring uh, to a close this uh, this webinar, I just want each of our speakers, maybe we can start with Miss Lillian Alex by just giving us your final thoughts on the topic and maybe just, you know, clearly coming out on what it is that you will want our participants, the residents of ESC and other stakeholders to do instead in, in terms of stepping up and maybe, you know, each one of us taking their role seriously, you know, waking up to the call just to push for this integration agenda. Miss Lillian Alex, if we can start with you, please. Thank you, Faith, um, and um, thank you again for this opportunity. And I just wanted to highlight the same thing that I've already um, just mentioned. And sorry, I just wanted to also highlight what Joseph had commended for me speaking first. We are trying to catch up with time. But then um, I think it's very clear. And um, as again, I say, I appreciate ELS for bringing all, all of us together. Already as we are the representatives in this meeting, we are as much as the stakeholders we can take. And we as much as the people who we can partner together to work through the reform and the amendment of the treaty. As I'm looking at the panelists, we already have the legal um, experts. We already have the East Africa Legislative Assembly. We have civil society, we have private sector. 
all the necessary stakeholders have clearly and strongly, and also we have academias have, I mean, have strongly been represented in this discussion. Maybe the only um, party we are missing here is a government representative, maybe somebody from the um, ministerial councils. But nevertheless, um, I believe um, there is there is hope for that, as um, just the previous speaker has spoken to that. Um, we already have hope, we just need to push. What Patma has said, we need to push all together as stakeholders. There is need to form if it's campaigns and uh, we as civil society through our um, our platforms, we're also having a civil society summit coming up. This is something that I'd also want to see how strongly we campaign again, I mean, towards it, that is having the amendment of the treaty, but also my, um, my biggest concern here, and I wanted to highlight it is that even if we are we have to also still push for implementation mm -hmm. and thank you for having the judiciary present because then um, together with the civil society we play the role of monitoring and um, maybe it's also time we also evaluate ourselves internally on how far have we gone with the monitoring of the implementation of the treaty as it is right now. Um, clearly there are a number of provisions that have not yet even been touched or not yet even yet been implemented as we are speaking right now. So as we are moving to reform, as we are moving to amend, we also need to see how best we can strategize um, the implementation strategy of the um, the new amended treaty that we are trying to propose in this discussion. So I believe there is hope for that, and I believe there is room for that to actually happen. But we also need to also bear in mind a strategy on how we ensure implementation, both at national levels and at the regional levels, to ensure that this discussion becomes a reality. Thank you, Faith. Thank you so much for sharing your parting shots. So at this point, I'll ask the Honorable uh, Dr. Abdullah, Abdullahi just to share his parting shots and then I will ask Carol Asimwe after the Honorable Doctor speaks, then you can also share your, your, your parting shots, please. Th thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And uh, before I give my parting shots, I'd like to just inform you that uh, we benefited uh, to have uh, among us Honorable Fatuma Dangiza, who just contributed. She's a member of Yala. Ambassador, and uh, she made some contributions, which is very, which really shows that uh, Iala is very concerned and uh, would like to be engaged in such dialogues because we are, we are, we are representing the people, and in such forums we get uh, to hear what uh, we are supposed to hear and uh, to to represent. But, uh, Madam Madam Moderator, uh, the issue here. And uh, that's what, uh, what I would like to have as a resolution is that the Council of Ministers of ESC should take their rightful role rather than sitting in the driver in the in the back seat. They should take the driver's seat as uh, the the treaty is uh, is is, is uh, trying to guide them to do so, because if they are members of the council and they're being given roles by the treaty. They should uh, take that role rather than delegating everything to be done by the technocrats. And uh, that is the, the reason why, because of, the, of, of them being absent in action, they necessitated the head of state from the Republic of Kenya to recall the Secretary General, because the council is not, is not up to task as they should have been. Hmm. And, uh, also, let me point out another thing, which is very important for you to know. At IALA, we had resolved to have the council to, to be laying comprehensive reports, which with, with timelines and then with the implementation of uh, the treaty protocols, projects and programs to the assembly. And when they're laying those to the assembly, then they're laying them before the East Africans and everyone can follow the proceedings of the assembly they can question the civil society and any other interested person can question there. And uh, we will be a very cooperative with the rest of the public to have the council to update us on implementation. Because you know, the problem is the council is implementing and when it's failing to achieve the target, it's not reporting anywhere. So it's becoming the referee, the judge, the lawyer and everything. So we, I think uh, we need to have that proper operation of tracking the implementation of the treaty at the, at the community and the, the people of the community 
the citizens are informed by the council through the reports being tabled to the assembly. The council had uh, agreed to, to that, but has not implemented that so far. And uh, also, the treaty talks about being people-centered and uh, being private sector-led. We need to see issues, genuine issues of the people, of the private sector being addressed. And uh, specifically, if we are really up to task, then the issues of NTBs should have been a bygone and a history. But also, allow me to finalize my submission by talking about the issue raised by my brother, uh, Kanjama, who spoke earlier on the issue of uh, multiple, be belonging to multiple regional groupings, like Tanzania belongs to SADC and ESC, and then uh, Kenya belongs to COMESA and ESC. So you are, you are seeing that you're having, this is what uh, one economy, one economy is called Jaguar, Jaguar Bagwati, called the spaghetti ball. Now, in efforts to address that, the ESC, SADC, and COMESA formed a trapetite, the ESC, SADC, COMESA trapetite, free trade area. But again, before we started achieving implementation of that, at the continental level, we have the African Free Continental, free, African continental free Trade Area. And uh, we want to trade as Africans. So probably, I think we can, we can do that if we are really up to task. But the problem with us Africans is that when you compare, after we, 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 we talk and implement, we talk more than what we implement. So we, we should be now action-oriented, and we need the private sector and the civil society, along with the parliament, to push for implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, the Honorable Dr. Abdullah. We really appreciate And also thank you so much again, the Honorable Fatuma, for setting aside your time, for joining us today, and for sharing your views. So over to you, um, Dr. Sime. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to come back and say my last remarks. One, I must reiterate and say that one thing we need to consider as we think about amendment of the treaty is the issue of communication. It is a critical issue that needs to be considered because in whatever we do, either in representation, either in oversight, either in business and trade or implementing other the protocols, we need communication. It is an issue that needs to be think, thought about critically. So it's a call to us all as key stakeholders to advocate for the communication as a critical issue because we cannot implement anything, we cannot achieve anything if we don't communicate the integration agenda to our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sime, for being precise to the point and straight. So I'll call upon um, Mr. John Kalisa, just to share your parting shot, please. And then there after senior counsel, Mr. Kanjama. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I want uh, my parting shot, there are three. One is that uh, I want to come back to the point raised by my sister Lillian. Who are the stakeholders? Who are the owners of the, uh, of the ES integration? It is a, a citizens, private sector, and the government. So we need to ensure that those three actors are, are working together, should not work in silos. We should ensure that we are working together. We need to bring, restore the, the role of the private sector integration, the role of civil society in integration. Here I mentioned about SDG CEO's forum. It has taken four years without any, any forum. So it means that it's something that we are not doing uh, well. The second aspect is accountability, accountability of the stakeholders. We need to, again to ensure that uh, there is an accountability framework that is clearly uh, articulated, shared by all the three stakeholders. Uh, the last one is that we need to take stock. 
tech stock, what we have achieved, and the gaps, and the gaps, the gaps before even we talk about the treaty, let's, let's look at the what have, have we achieved and where are the gaps. So that we bring back on, uh, we bring back on board all the stakeholders and uh, really ensure that uh, we uh, we continue to uh, to address those issues. And finally, and I think it has been raised by my brother, Doctor Abdul. Hmm? Do we have any framework? Like uh, there are kinds of decisions that are made. There are the head of the head of the head, heads of state decisions that are made. Sometimes they are not implemented. Do we have any any mechanism uh, for enforcing those decisions? So we need to have a kind of a scorecard every year annually that is reviewed by all the three stakeholders, so that we are able to have a strong checks and balances uh, within our, uh, our our framework. And I think uh, finally, uh, this is what I'm going to do with uh, my sister Lillian. We need to review our private sector civil society engagement framework. We must review it. We must bring it to the, to the limelight. So those are my parting shots. And I want to thank again, uh, East African Law Society uh, for giving us the platform. And we look forward to continue working together. Asante Nisana. Thank you so much, Mr. John Kalisa. Senior Counsel, Mr. Kanjama, please. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Faith, just kindly restate for me what I'm responding to. You're not responding to anything. It's just to give you your parting shot. Okay, the very well. Words to our participants, yes. Okay, so uh, there was a question I'd been asked about um, the role of um, professionals and civil society organizations mm -hmm. to, to participate in the journey of integration. And I think my parting shot will be a response to that question. That is fine. That's in order. Yeah. So uh, the, the journey of integration includes the structural uh, dimension where you focus on what are the treaty organs. We have the summit, we have the council, we have the East African Court of Justice, EALA, the Legislative Assembly, the Secretariat. And then we try to uh, create structures for the East African professional civil society organizations and other coalitions to, to get into the structure of the treaty and engage. And that I think is a very useful thing. But it is to be expected that at the level of organs, the people who are involved are just a small minority of all the stakeholders of the East African community. I want to talk about the second uh, part of the uh, journey of regional integration, which is the organic involvement of stakeholders. Like at uh, this session we are having, uh, courtesy of the East African Law Society, is, is a very useful session. We don't necessarily have to appear anywhere in the treaty of the East African community for us to participate effectively. So there's need to get these stakeholders, professional bodies, civil society organizations, the residents of the various countries of East Africa uh, to participate in the journey of integration, to participate in the journey of recognizing ourselves as East African citizens or citizens of the East African community. The same way we've been in that journey in our respective countries so that we don't think of ourselves based on my small ethnic community or clan, but I, I, I start identifying myself uh, as a citizen of these countries that were set up uh, because of the scramble for Africa in the Berlin Conference and are still in, in the 70 years of independence from 1960, we're in the 60-something years, we've not reached 70. We also need to gradually start viewing ourselves as East African citizens and engaging with one another as such, trading with each other, uh, appreciating the history of the other countries. For example, in our curriculum, in our schools, do we focus just on the pre-colonial and colonial history focus of our respective countries? Or do the people in Uganda learn 
as much about Kenya and Tanzania as they learn about Ugandan history and vice versa, the people in Tanzania and so on. So I feel that as we, we the professionals pursue the technical and structural uh, work of making the East African community organs responsive to the ideals of the treaty, we also need to go to the grassroots and see how do we get the residents and general stakeholders on this journey. Because it is those general stakeholders who will eventually uh, persuade the political players to come along on the journey. And, and I want to finish by making a comment that I've heard from politicians when you're involved in advocacy. They say that politicians are very sensitive to uh, the political sentiment of their political bedrock of support, the people. If you expect the politicians to stretch out their necks and pioneer things, they, they find that they don't have the support of the people, they are exposing themselves. But if the people are pushing for this agenda, then the politicians see where the wind is blowing and they champion the same cause. So I'd like to finish by asking us here to see how can we get the grassroots, the professional bodies, community, civil society organizations to champion this agenda of a regional integration. And then it will be secure and it will be unstoppable. Thank you so much, Senior Council, Mr. Kanjama. His Worship, please, if you can also share with us your parting shots. Uh, thank you, Faith. First, I think we must applaud the civil society for the role they played in drafting the treaty in the first place. If it wasn't for the civil society, what we currently have in Article 6D and 72 will not be the way it is in its current form. There's a lot of back and forth, all spearheaded by the civil society. Uh, secondly, there is always an agenda in every council meeting of the implementation of previous council decisions. And I can tell you in every subsequent council meeting, the pages of that agenda keep increasing. Why? Because the implementations are not being carried out after it gets to a point where we say any decision that has stayed for more than five years without being implemented or three years, now it's being removed. Yet it was a decision of the councils not being implemented. I hope the good news Dr. Makami has just given us about the reduction of the quorum to five uh, is going to be implemented. First of all, I hope there's going to, they are going to have quorum on it so that it is implemented. Uh, and that will be very, very welcome. Last, what is this appetite for joining the block, especially for the last five years? Is it because they think it is so easy to join? Suppose we had said you must be an observer for a minimum of five years, after which your progress is reviewed. If not, it is extended and extended. Will we be having many countries knocking the door to join the community like that? Is it a gap they saw in joining the community? That say, say this is an easy route, let us join ESC, irrespective of the repercussions and the consequences that we'll have once they join ESC. Let's examine that. Let's look at that in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, His Worship, for sharing your thoughts. Now, um, just to my participants, I know we have touched on several touch points, and all of us in this webinar are residents of ESC and in different capacities. So if each one of us can commit to work, or, to work on one or two of the touch points that have come up in the course of our discussions in different ways, in our different capacities, and where we can team up or perhaps even collaborate, and I will highly encourage us to, to think about that, we will be playing our role as stakeholders. My plea is let us not be amongst those who are crying too loudly and doing nothing let us purpose to take action. We can do something at the level where we are. The East Africa Law Society has shown us uh, as the way, they're a good example. And that is my challenge and my call on all of us this evening. Thank you so much. And I also want to take uh, this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude
to our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for the thought provoking conversations and all our attendees for your active participations, for your reactions, for your views, for your questions, and just staying on to the end of the session. So today's deliberations are not only an opportunity for reflection, but also a call for action. Thank you all for your engagement, your insights, and commitment to this important dialogue. Till next time, bye and see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you, our moderator. Faith, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Faith. That was beautiful. Good evening. Good evening to you. Thank you. Bye.